Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Fun Talks podcast. We are excited for today's episode as we're interviewing the most interesting man in law in the state of Nevada, featuring former governor of Nevada, as well as U.S. Senator and now Fenimore attorney, Mr. Richard Bryan. You have quite the storied history, and we are so thankful and lucky to have you as a member of our team. And you started your legal career actually back in 1964. So would you mind just sharing a little bit more about what it was like to be the deputy district attorney in Clark County in Nevada in the 1960s? Well, my father had been in the district attorney's office when he got out of law school. And although he had passed away by the time I graduated from law school, he always said to me, the DA's office is where you can get some great experience. And he was right. To get some context in this, I think we probably had eight or nine deputy district attorneys. Today in Clark County, there would be well over a hundred. So it was kind of a small, closely knit group. Uh, the bar in Nevada was uh, quite small. And the lawyers who handled the defense work, there was no public defender's office initially, uh, we uh, all gathered, you know, to wait for jury verdicts at, uh, at Lulu's, which uh, served adult beverages. And uh, there was a real sense of camaraderie, but it was small, it was intimate in many respects. It was kind of a golden age. The whole state of Nevada probably had 250,000 people and maybe 65, 75,000 Las Vegas to give you some idea just how small it was. It's interesting to hear some of these stories because now when you look at that market, wow, things have changed quite a bit throughout the years. So from that role, you went on to be named Clark County's first public defender in 1966. So how did that opportunity even come about? I'm curious to hear the story. Well, you know, I think I, I think I was lucky. And, uh, you know, Confucius used to say is that, uh, that luck is when, uh, when opportunity collides with preparation. And having served in the DA's office, I felt eligible to apply. Uh, John Mowbray, district court judge here in Las Vegas and later a Supreme Court justice in Nevada, John Mowbray liked me. And uh, he was the one who was instrumental in getting the public defender program uh, started here. The Ford Foundation was making significant grants to jurisdictions that established a public defender program. And Clark County was going to receive a couple hundred thousand dollars. So the county commissioners uh, was, yeah, we, we need to we need to adopt this program. And so I made an application. Uh, Mowbray was a great advocate for me. And uh, several of the other lawyers have been good friends of my father. And several of them I knew relatively well. So, you know, three were... Uh, screened. And uh, the key was Ralph Lamb. Uh, many of the Phoenix lawyers would not know who that is, but Ralph was an all-powerful sheriff. And Ralph was uh, in my corner. He was the first one I talked to. And Ralph said, look, yeah, you're, you're my candidate. His brother was on the county commission, one of the votes that I needed. Uh, and everybody called him Dar. It was Darwin. And so with uh, Ralph Lamb's support, that was terribly important. And some of my father's contact and the fact that I had been in the DA's office, uh, uh, the county commission uh, selected me and it was a great opportunity. It was a brand new office. And uh, in effect, at 28, I was a department head. There were four deputies, so it wasn't exactly that big an office. But it was a wonderful time in my life. The four of us, uh, in, four in additional to me, uh, you know, a lot of people have been opposed to the public defender's office. It's very controversial. You're just going to do rubber stamp uh, justice. You know, you're really not going to represent these indigent defendants. Uh, so we every Friday, uh, we'd get together in the library and have uh, some adult beverages and talk about our cases and appearing before this judge and that judge. What are the eccentricities that we need to be aware of? So it was a real sense of camaraderie. Everybody's case was something that uh, all of us were willing to help out on. And so it was really a great experience. And still, now I'm in the DA's office, not the public defender's office, but we still met from time to time after work for an adult beverage and waiting for these jury verdicts. So it was a very small, intimate bar 
uh, Lindsay is the bottom line of that time. You know, Senator, you've mentioned a couple of times now these adult beverages. I'm just curious, what is your favorite adult beverage? Well, in those days, it was beer. But I may have a very sophisticated palate today. Uh, I'm a wine drinker and I'm on a budget. So I have two buck chuck. I don't know if you have that in Arizona. That's Charles Shaw. And that's uh, that's a very affordable beverage. And I, I enjoy an adult beverage or two every night with dinner. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to hopefully sharing um, some more stories over a bottle of two buck chuck in the near future. <laughs> In 1972, you were elected in the state Senate and you did such a tremendous job that you were actually reelected in 1976. Then in 1988, you were elected to the U.S. as a senator. So I'm just curious throughout the course of this, that time, you know, you had a lot of different experiences on the state and the national level as a senator. What was one of your most favorite stories as a senator? You know, that's a tough one. I'm not sure there's a favorite story, but, uh, there, there were just so many incredible things that would happen, you know, going to rural Nevada. In those days, again, to put some context, Nevada was still a very small state. And those of us, I had been attorney general and uh, governor and uh, later senators, you point out. And so I made it a point of visiting all of these uh, small towns at their traditional events. Uh, you know, Jim Butler days and Tonopah Goldfield days and Goldfield, you know, and uh, so you really got to know people. I always made it a practice to walking the parade route after I was uh, completed. I guess one of the more unusual stories, Hazen uh, in Nevada had a parade. Uh, there were three or four cars. And so we drove around three times, you know, to give it the effect that it was a larger. Uh, Virginia City had the fireman's muster and they brought in all of these old pieces of fire equipment uh, from all over the West, uh, a hand pumpers from San Francisco dating back to the 1850s. And Virginia City could be a little cool in the early morn. And so the first, uh, the first uh, vehicle that was towed through the line was the hand pumper. And on the bottom was uh, uh, a little spigot. And uh, they always gave uh, those of us on the, the, the judging stand a little brandy in the morning. So that was an additional inducement to be at Virginia City, the Comstock vote. Great experiences, great times. You've had the opportunity to have multiple different roles, whether that's in government and or in the legal world. So I'm curious, what has been your most favorite and why? Well, you know, when I, my father was active in politics, as I pointed out, and I always knew I was gonna get into politics. I guess by the time I was in seventh or eighth grade, and I was a class president, uh, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer, and I always knew that the ultimate goal was being governor. So I knew early on, it took me a while to get there, and we wouldn't want to give our fellow colleagues a suggestion that it was a Silk Road. No, I ran for attorney general once uh, and was defeated uh, by about 700 votes. Four years later, I ran again. The first race was close enough, and the incumbent was quite an able fellow. Uh, that the Republicans didn't even put a candidate in the race for attorney general. So that was uh, that was pretty close to a walk in the park. But I there was a setback. So and there was a setback along the way, you know, when you're in high school and college. Uh, I think those things are helpful because life uh, has some unexpected bumps in the road for all of us. I completely agree. I think that's something that we can all take away from this is that, you know, we do overcome some of these challenges, but th throughout those challenges in your professional journey, uh, it seems as though you found a way to find success at every single level. So well, I think the key thing though, is, you know, how you handle, you know, defeat, you know, wait a minute, you know, I mean, if woe on me and that's not it. Okay. There's some things that I probably did wrong. Uh, there were some opportunities I missed. And being able to bounce back, I think, is the key thing. And I was very fortunate. Uh, I had a wife who was very supportive and enjoyed uh, all of these rural Nevada tours and, and the aspect of politics. And that was very helpful. Nobody disliked her. I can't say the same thing about me, but she was really kind of my best asset along the campaign trail. And we had three kids that were involved in the campaigns and they walked door to door. They went to some of these events with us. So it was really a family undertaking, and that was very helpful. 
So it sounds like perseverance, having the right mindset and the right support system ultimately has helped you to be successful throughout your career. No, no question about it. I was lucky. I mean, there's just no question. I had all those factors going for me. And in fairness uh, to those who are competing in public life today, it was not as polarized. It was not as acrimonious. It was not, you know, a perfect experience in the sense that, you know, decade before in the United States Senate, I mean, there was much more collegiality than in my time. But, you know, in the 12 years I was in the Senate, it was much, much different than it's become today, I'm sad to say. Well, you've paved a beautiful floor plan and footprint for those to follow in your footsteps moving forward. So for those individuals that want to be just like U.S. Senator Richard Bryan, what would be your advice for those individuals? Well, I'd say get involved. I mean, uh, the community, the state, uh, various organizations, get involved in your community. My father had an expression, which I have not heard elsewhere. I'm not suggesting he originated, but he always say that each of us in society has an obligation to pay his or her civic rent. That's involvement. If you think you want to be involved in politics, you know, get involved in a campaign and see if this is really the sort of thing uh, that you want to do. And then be prepared. You know, there's opportunities that come along and be prepared and and understand that, uh, you know, there are going to be people that are going to say unkind, untrue things, but you've got to have a fairly tough skin to do it. And uh, it's very important that your spouse or significant other is part uh, of that decision. If he or she is not, it makes it very, very difficult with you all. You know, with uh, his or her support, it makes an enormous difference, particularly after those days that don't go as well as you'd like to. I think it's wonderful how you shared that story about how your father made that lasting impression for you. But I'm curious, I know you've made impressions on other individuals within the business community, as well as even within our firm at here at Fenimore. But as you reflect back on your career and think about, you know, at the end, your end game, what do you want to be known for or known as throughout all the work that you've done throughout the history of well, your life? I always valued my integrity. That was, you know, people can disagree with you and that's that's reasonable. And people can think, God, he's not very intelligent. How could he possibly reach that conclusion? But integrity to me was uh, the most important thing. I think people will say, you know, I didn't always agree with him, but he worked hard at it. Integrity, uh, hard work. I enjoyed people. That's why, and I know we have to do it in this day and age, this working from home, it's just been a terrible experience for me because I like an environment where you interact with people and, and you can exchange uh, personal experiences, a little humor and that sort of thing. So I think those are integrity, hard work. Uh, and uh, if you enjoy people, uh, the political world gives you a lot of opportunities. Well, I know you're already on the path for individuals to remember you for those specific elements, but as we look to wrap up today's conversation, really appreciate your time and all this insight that you've offered to our business community. But is there anything else that you'd like to leave with them or offer to them as we wrap up today's conversation? Well, let me say that I think the experience that I've had at Fenmore has been just terrific. We have an extraordinary management team. They are very inclusive. I mean, I've been in other firms where that has not been uh, as emphasized. I mean, there's plenty of interaction. Uh, all the partners in the firm are briefed every day on you know, the, the deposits, uh, very much inclusive. I think that's one of the strengths of uh, Fenimore, in addition to recruiting some fine lawyers and some extraordinary people that support our efforts. But uh, uh, a real kudos to the management team and to the inclusiveness that they have fostered in that, well, it's nearly five years now that I've been a part of this wonderful firm. It's been a great experience for me. Well, Senator Richard Bryan, really appreciate you taking the time to join us for today's conversation on the Fun Talks podcast. I've enjoyed it too, Lindsay. Good luck to you. 